Hey, Dr. Schmidt, how's it going? Good, Joey. How you doing? I'm good. good. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you. I've been following your channel for quite some time, so th this should be fun. Yeah, you know, I just saw you, what, a week ago or two for the first time. And I, you were interviewing somebody. I was like, I want to be on this channel because you're pretty, you know, straightforward, eloquent when you speak. And I just reached out to you to, to, to collaborate. Yeah, I'm really happy you did. Um, th this, this should be good. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my story, and then you can tell me about yours, and we'll just have a have have a good discussion about a lot of different topics in the, in the space. Yeah, sounds good. Cool. So I, I grew up in a very health conscious household. My mom's a nutritionist, um, was very into the low fat paradigm. We didn't really have fat as, as kids, my sister and I, mostly vegetables and stuff like that. Uh, and some lean protein. Uh, but whenever I had the chance to eat fat, like I would go to my grandmother's house on occasion, and she would make chicken soup. And there'd be a, a lot a fair amount of fat in there. And I would just continually want more. So I, I'd always craved fat, I'd always loved animal foods. Um, and I just, I didn't really have much of them. Because also, in the you know more recent few years, I deluded myself into thinking that they were bad for me. And I continued with the low fat thing for a period of time, even when I was really, really young, like weirdly young, I was health conscious, like a 10 year old kid going out to restaurants and not wanting to order something that was unhealthy. It was, it was always in the back of my mind. And it wasn't until I'd stay around age 16 that I started getting into weightlifting and wanting to get stronger. And so as a result, my friends and I started doing the things that the bodybuilders typically do, like eating whey protein and bananas and very, very low fat, the occasional avocado for fat, egg whites. Like I told my mom to buy a carton of egg whites because I don't want I don't want the yolks anymore. I thought there was no point in just screwing up the macronutrient breakdown and having unnecessary fat. I mean, that's how stupid I was. And I just think back and it's some of the stuff that Greg Doucette says too. It's just completely ignoring micronutrients and just looking at macros and having huge volume for low calories. And it's just, you know, I, I was totally entrenched in that way of thinking. And eventually I started to pay the price. Um, it sort of manifested as skin problems and chronic fatigue, stuff like that. And so I learned about low carb diets almost instantly went on a low carb diet, like it didn't take long, because the evidence was so clear, just on high carb versus low carb. So that's what I that's what I did. I, I did started doing a, um, a low carb diet. And the problem was I was eating too many vegetables, like I sure I, I decreased my intake of grains and stuff. But I upped the intake of uh, green stuff like broccoli, and all that, you know, crap. And that really did a number on me. So I was more gassy. I was still relatively fatigued. I was consuming huge volumes of food. Um, I lost body fat, but it didn't matter because I felt awful. I felt absolutely awful. I did my muscle um, sort of gaining process, which is what I wanted to do. It was not expedited as I thought it would be. My soccer performance was failing terribly. I remember I went keto and then I went on the field like the next week I could not run for my life, which which is in huge contrast to going carnivore because then I could just instantly start running. It was crazy. So, you know, it, it keto didn't work well for me. Learned about vegetables from Paul Saladino, started eating meat and fruit for six months. I did that about a year ago, maybe a little bit over a year ago, started eating only meat and fruit. And for the past six, seven months, after learning about what fructose does and deciding this is probably something that I don't want to stay away from. I've been eating only meat with the occasional, you know, yogurt and berries here and there, but it's been, it's been straight carnivore pretty much for, for six, seven months. Wow. That's cool. Interesting. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, um, I grew up on a, the family farm. And so, and my mom, uh, she went to, to Ohio State and she studied home ec. And she, when she was a kid, she would travel the country giving cooking demonstrations. She had some sort of a, a status that she was awarded because of uh, her presentation skills. And um, so growing up, <clears throat> she would make uh, 
pot roasts and stuff and big hunks of meat. And it was great. She actually ended up going to back to school to get her master's in, when I was in high school or actually grade school. And then she started uh, buying convenient food and I got cavities. And then um, in chiropractic school, and now we're talking 1995, I was in chiropractic school and uh, about a quarter of my class were vegetarian. The, the mm. word vegan barely was, nobody said that word vegan. And the vegetarian people were eating soy hot dogs. You know, it was like it was crap food, but, and, and bean soup, you know? So I did that for about a year and a quarter and it was, it was miserable. I couldn't get out of bed for, you know, after an hour of hitting the snooze button and um, my hair was falling out and I was depressed and angry. So then I graduated from school in 97 I moved back home and my sister threw me a graduation party, like a welcome home party. And she had bought a whole bunch of Browers. And so for that first, you know, let's say like four months, and there was a lot of Browers left after the party was over. Mm -hmm. I spent three days working in the, on the farm and then three days working in the office. And I, you know, barely made any money. I was just trying to start my practice. But when I worked on the farm, you know, near where I lived, I would go home for lunch. I'd have two bratwurst for lunch and then three for dinner. And it, I did that for a long time and I felt better. And I thought, okay, and it had the white bread, you know, like, and I felt better. And I was like, okay, this is, that was better than being a vegetarian. So then in 99, I, I saw a newspaper ad and it said, learn about nutrition in our living room. So I went to this couple's house and they're teaching the principles from Weston Price and you know the Price Pottinger Foundation, the Weston A. Price right. Foundation, and the girl, the the wife said, the value of dairy includes the good fat. Why would you want to drink low fat milk or have low fat cottage cheese? That's when I realized, okay, I've been trained that fat is bad, and everybody's been trained that fat is bad. But you're saying that there's some good fat, and that changed everything. So I learned about low carb from her. So I started going low carb in '99, and I was very strict for the next 16 years. And I stayed less than 75 grams of carbs a day. And if I cheated, I was still less than 125 grams of carbs a day. And I never got into ketosis and I didn't even test it, but I started getting into ketosis in 2015. And then I realized, okay, I've never felt this way before. And I would go like high carb, low carb, high carb, low carb, and that was fine. But then I went carnivore in August of 2018, and meaning probably 95% of my calories are coming from meat. And then mm -hmm. I feel better than ever, ever before because of that diet. So for the first year I had, I had one rule and that was eat as much meat as I possibly can every day. So I was stuffing my face and I was going to the gym and I was putting on weight and I always had trouble putting on weight my whole life. And so that worked out really well. Now, all my, then all my clothes got too tight. And I thought, well, and plus, I, I thought, well, I could buy new clothes or I could just lose 10 pounds. <laughs> so I, then I changed my rule to eat as much meat as I need or want for the day. Okay. And so that's basically what I've been doing for three years. Eat, eat as much meat as I want or need for the day. And the thing about the vegetables, I have, I, I, have said this for a few years on my YouTube channel. I'll say I eat iceberg lettuce, but don't tell anybody. And I say that because people think iceberg lettuce is just nothing but green water. But when you look at it, it's crispy. It's got fiber. You know, if you want something crispy, just I just have like two heads of iceberg lettuce a month, basically. And then we'll, you mentioned Paul Saladino. He, he talked about fructose. So Back in 2019, when I was putting on a lot of weight, uh, going to the gym, I craved fruit about once a month. So I'd have like five apples and I'd eat that in two days. Then I was good for the next month. So mm. I think I got depleted of glycogen from lifting weights a lot. So that's been helpful. And then I, I've been trying to maybe eat more fruit, but I don't think I need to, you know, like I eat more honey, but I look back and it's like, no, it didn't really help me, you know, so going back to more carnivores. So the diet's always an experiment to see, you know, what, what your body needs at that time. Yeah. I, I like, I like that approach looking at it as an experiment. 
every now and then, you know, I have the same thing. I crave a piece of fruit. And in which case, I mean, I, it, these are no longer the residual sugar cravings from being on a diet with sugar for so long. Like for some people within the first two weeks, it's like, yeah, you're, you're going to crave sugar. But it's not like that for me. If I'm craving a piece, piece of fruit, I find that it's probably likely that my body wants something that's in the fruit, something. Um, so, yeah. And you... You brought up some some cool points like with the, with the bratwurst thing. I talked to some guy today a couple hours ago, and he was vegan for five years. And he talked about how the day he decided not to be vegan anymore, he goes to Dairy Queen, orders five, um, just quarter pound patties, and he ordered. He went to McDonald's, got a couple of burgers, and he said the next day he woke up with more mental clarity than he'd ever had in his life. And it's like, yeah, I mean, me, being deprived of meat will have that effect and you also you also talked about putting on weight you know i'm i'm in a i'm in a fraternity now i'm i'm pledging um at, at ucla and there are a lot of guys there who are really really skinny and so you know how in frats it's, they you want it's a lot of them are lifting weights and they're hitting the gym and stuff and they all have their own theories and the skinny guys they're just like oh eat more calories eat more bread eat more pastas and it's like well this has been this has been the idea for skinny guys for so long and it clearly doesn't work right. like go, going carnivore is such a good way for skinny people to to put on mass and you, you, i mean you, you're a testament to that you mentioned that it, it helped you yeah yeah exactly so you know you said you claimed that you said that you were stupid because of your thoughts on food well everybody's been trained that fat is bad <clears throat> so even in 99 when i was low carb Okay, I moved from Ohio to Michigan in 2000. And I remember going shopping, maybe it was early 2001. And I was at the store and they had buy one steak, get one free. And I was like, I hadn't had a red, you know, red, red meat steak in like at least six months, maybe a year. And I was like, okay, I'll buy one. I'll buy, I bought, buy them both, eat one tonight, put the other one in the freezer for next week. So I ate that one that night and I felt so good waking up. I ate the second one the very next day. Mm. So again, that's just another, and the reason why we all think that red meat is bad, fat is bad, et cetera, is because it comes from the top, right? And the top is unfortunately the government, the USDA with their dietary guidelines and stuff. And every five years they have to change the guidelines. So the last time they did this back in, you know, right before the, pandemic um i was active in trying to make them look at science hmm. so they're, they're not looking at science they're looking at surveys they think that surveys is science and but surveys you know is, they're really poor at getting fact they're, they're good at getting opinion you know so everybody thinks this way because everybody's been duped by so-called government experts who refuse to look at the science and they're only looking at opinion yeah. yeah yeah definitely um it, it's cool it's it's uh it's just very uh it's a really strange thing to think about um when they you know th what what's sort of motivating these guidelines i know that there's uh, like there's sort of a debate going on from what i found in the carnivore space where some people think it's deliberate where it's oh there's some person at the top orchestrating the downfall of humanity while other things is just profit oriented and i i mean i, I think the latter makes much more sense it's like the, the going going for the money tends to come at the expense of human health that seems to be what's going on there um and i can, no, I can tell you i'll tell you exactly what it is because yeah. I, I i went there okay so here's the deal in the summer of uh 2019 they had a public speaking opportunity in washington dc and there's like 60 and i'm you know i did it there's a couple of videos of that on youtube one on my channel other people posted what i said everybody got three minutes but and that was on one day well i was there the previous day and i sat all day long just listening and they had slides up you know there's probably like maybe 15 or 20 people in this committee and the reason why they look at the surveys and not the science is because they're ignorant on the subject of what is science that's the reason now there are a couple people there's one guy that worked for nestle and they uh, sell the opti um whatever there's a weight loss powder that they sell like a chocolate flavored 
Huh. Yeah, so, so there is that. But I saw a lot of the people in the committee have these aha moments like, oh, well, this study says when you avoid red meat, then you don't, you know, you don't get heart attacks. It's like, well, okay, that's not science. That study was just a survey, but nobody sat there and explained it. Like, okay, this is not science, right? And I think 80, and I saw their studies, they put them up on the slide presentation, 85% of what they had on the screen were surveys and not science. So it's ignorance. It's a group of 20 people that are ignorant and that's why they keep re recommending um, low fat, low animal protein. And also, and this started really back in 1980. There's a vegan, I forgot his name, David something. And he, he claimed like, we have nothing to lose, right? All these people are having heart attacks. We got high cholesterol. And uh, Ansel Key said that eating animals is bad. And so this guy told the committee, like, let's just, reduce the fat, reduce animal protein, we got nothing to lose. And he's completely 100% wrong. You know, so that's why everybody's, there's so many people who are overweight. Yeah. Do, yeah. You, do you have any, do you have any opinions on um, the mixing of carbohydrate and fat, like in the Randall cycle and stuff like that? Do you think it's as large, plays as big of a role as some people think it does? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, I did study that it's been a few years since I studied the Randall cycle and, uh, maybe I did a video about it or not, but it's not stuck in my head. If it was something that was clinically important, it would stay in my head and I would tell my patients, <laughs> Yeah, so if it's left my brain, I don't think it's that important. Now I know that Paul Saladino just did a video and the title was don't be afraid of the Randall cycle, I think is what the title was, but mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still, you know, I'm still something I'm still learning about. Like you, you look at you look at the mechanism, and it, I mean, it makes sense. Like you, you get the fructose, and it blocks out of blocks out the fat, or vice versa. But I just think, I mean, the human body is so complicated, and to to simplify it to a, a single process, it seems a little bit reductionist in a way. I mean, that that, that that's a thing. I'm still trying to navigate through all this since there's so much. And I'm at, I'm at a point where I love learning, and there's so much to learn, but it's it's pretty overwhelming. Like there's so much to to, to get through. Um, right. Yeah. And what's interesting is the evolution of the collective thought process on all this. So it was the Weston A. Price Foundation that those people, for several decades, they held the line. And I, you know, one of the names is Mary Enoch. She's passed away now. But she, you know, there's a, just a few people. And um, and then and the 1990s were, the 80s were a crappy decade for good nutritional advice. The 90s were crappy. And then the keto people just started talking, you know, in the 2000, 2010, let's say. Um, Mercola was really bashing sugar around 2000, you know, doing a good, good job with that. And then the sugar consumption started to level off. And then, um, so keto was strong back in 2010, 2014. And there were like keto courses that did really well, for, like as uh, for sale on Facebook in 2014, 2015, then Facebook started to censor that. And then along comes like Sean Baker talking about the carnivore diet. You know, mm -hmm. so when he spoke on that Joe Rogan podcast, he's like, look, don't be afraid of me. And he, and that was new for me, too. Like, even though I knew my body loved me and stuff like that, he's like, just don't be afraid of it. There's and then Nina Teicholz, she oh, did yeah. a fantastic video about what is science. You know, she's talking about the, the science pyramid at the very top. You have double blank placebo controlled clinical trials. And then just below that um clinical trials and then below that everything is a survey so when she you know i watched that like three times in a row <laughs> once i caught that you know on the on my feed so then just putting all that together it's like okay meat is good and then uh we are you know grains and sugar uh not so good and then now we're talking about vegetables like so i've i've been putting some people on a no vegetable diet and i had a woman um she had the one of the worst cases of GERD I've ever seen. 
And this is mm -hmm. pretty new. This is this past summer. And we tried a bunch of supplements for two months and, and nothing worked. And then I said, okay, now it's time to stop all the plants. And she goes, but that's my favorite food. I have these big salads with all the colors of the rainbow and I pour olive oil. Yeah. Like that. And, and then two months later, she, I mean, she stopped it. And then two months later, she's 100% cured. Wow. So, 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 you know, it's not just, Hey, eat some vegetables. It's more like, Hey, what vegetables are causing you harm? Like mm. that's my viewpoint. Like you're, you eat vegetables. Oh yeah. I have asparagus, broccoli, salads. It's like, okay, those, those are pretty toxic. You know, they're, yeah. they're bad for the thyroid. They can cause harm to your stomach. The salicylates are bad for the stomach. And like, like aspirin, that's salicylic acid. And everybody knows if you take too much aspirin, you're going to get a, you know, heartburn and maybe an ulcer in your stomach. Hmm. Well, salicylic acid or salicylates, they're in all plants, you know, some are way more, some are way less, but people with heartburn and, and GERD, you got to look at the plants that you're eating. It might be a cause for your heartburn. Right. No, yeah, it's really interesting that she mentioned that her favorite food is was salads. And my, my mom would say the same thing. I mean, my mom loves salads, has been eating them for so long. And like, it's not, it just simply doesn't seem biologically, physiologically possible for that to be their favorite food in in a natural state it's simply because they they've tricked themselves into liking them and i was kind of in a same in a similar position i, I really believe that, that, that they tricked themselves into liking them i was in a similar position where um i thought since since that they were since they were good for me i kind of felt this personal reward from eating them like i was doing something good for myself and and therefore it was something that i looked forward to because i thought i was you know doing something beneficial for my body but um just now having been without that stuff for so long i can actually think with a clear mind like without any sort of intrusion i can really realize that um that these things are are just toxic like like they, they, yeah. they're completely toxic so everybody's different and i think it's genetic and i just have to say that vegans will say the same thing about our diet they're gonna say you've tricked yourself into believing that eating meat is good for you or a reward or something but okay. anyways but but to the genetics part, there's a guy named Colin, I want to say it's Colin O'Brady. And um, he's an, uh, an endurance athlete. He's got like five world records. Like he climbed the top five highest mountains in the shortest period of time. And he's the first person to cross Antarctica solo. And that was like three years ago. Anyways, when he was done with that, people, somebody asked him the question, well, what did you have after you got back? Because he's eating, he's eating these like energy bars. And I thought he would say a steak, but he said salad. He says it gives me light. It's like, it's like the sun in the, in the bowl or whatever. So, mm. you know, th there's, there's the genetic component of like how well your body can deal with oxalates, phytates, salicylates, gluten, all that's the probably the biggest factor. And if yeah. then yeah, so if you have no trouble with that, and then your body metabolizes um the vegetables, and you can get into ketosis sometimes in some way, whether you're fasting or endurance exercise, I think you're you're gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. I think ketosis is the key for everybody, whether it's eating the ketogenic diet carnivore diet fasting endurance exercise at some at least once a year you have to do you know a, a longer period of time of being in, in ketosis yeah yeah you know i, I think that that genetics model is, makes sense it's what i've seen as well two weeks of you could kind it wasn't even veganism i had, I had some fish like I, I i tried to go i tried to not eat any animal foods at all because i listened to david sinclair he said the amount of animal protein you eat is inversely associated with your lifespan. More and more animal protein you eat, the shorter you're going to live. It's a, it's a, that simple. That's what he said. And I, um, I, I bought it because I'm like, okay, this Harvard professor is saying this and who am I to question it? He's, he seems smarter than me. So, you know, why would I not listen? Um, that's like an, an idea that I've just totally thrown away. Uh, and like in the last, after learning what I 
what I now know, but I believed him. So I tried to do the whole plant-based thing and I did the best plant-based diet you could ever imagine. Like I did exactly what they said. I ate the whole rainbow. I didn't not eat enough food. I ate enough food to the point where my stomach, like I, I, I ate so much food. Um, I, I did the perfect vegan diet and with the exception of the fish, of course, it's like that, that, that's what, that's what saved me. But for even after a couple of weeks, like I was dead, I was, it destroyed me. And people do this thing for years. People do this thing for decades and, and can, can handle it. It's like, there's such a, such a uh, variation in our resilience to plant toxins and our capability to live without certain, um, without like adequate levels of essential nutrients for long, for long periods of time. It's kind of baffling. Yeah. So <clears throat> with, you know, every six months, I'm a better prick clinician than I was six months earlier. And so, so in the last few weeks, I've had a few patients. I'm on the phone with them. You know, some patients, I, I talk to them every six months or every four months. And there's been two patients recently. And they're like, well, my diet's good. I'm eating meat and vegetables. I only use avocado oil or coconut oil. I don't use canola oil. But I have a little arthritis in my finger and my stomach hurts a little bit, a little bit of heartburn. And then the one patient, a woman, she had a, a negative, uh, a bad pap smear. And she's doing all the things that I said three years ago. Right? And then mm. and so one, one woman and then a guy. Mm. I'm like, okay, look, I'm going to update you on the things that I've learned. This is new for me. I'm going to have you do full carnivore, no seed oils, of course, and then no fruit oils, no olive, olive oil, avocado oil, and coconut oil. And then just do, let's just do like meat for a week and nothing but, and just see what happens like that. And then, and then, so we're swinging that pendulum, you know, to an extreme for that person, but you know, that, that regular diet of like meat and vegetables, like if you have a plate and it's mostly vegetables, I still think that's not enough. I, th I think that's not healthy. I think mm -hmm. that it should be, obviously most of your calories should come from meat, you know? If, okay. The, and this is just a general rule of thumb. And of course, everybody's different, but if you have symptoms, then something's wrong with your diet. You know, you could have unlucky exposures. I've been talking about that a lot. Like I had black mold or somebody can have parasites from swimming in a, in a lake or a river. So there's one thing, yeah, unlucky exposures, but then you got the poor lifestyle choices. Yeah, I think most people are deficient in meat for sure. And then one more thing, you mentioned Sinclair. He's, I saw an ad on social media. David Sinclair recommends these two products, NMN and something else, and it tricks your body into thinking that it's young. Is he sponsored? But, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I didn't catch if he's sponsoring it or not, but they use his name. So maybe he's selling the supplements. And then the mm -hmm. other person is Walter Longo. He sells the fasting mimicking diet, which is a kit. It's like 100, 300 bucks, 200 bucks. I forgot. I bought it once. And he said the same thing. The more animal meat that you eat, the shorter your life. Well, that's, again, that's, that's epidemiology. That's not a science. Like that's false. Yeah. And and then if you challenge him on it, which he has been challenged, written to be published in a recent, you know, a journal, medical journal, well, they they would not publish it. And it turns out he was on the board of that journal. So he refused competition with this thinking process. And when I heard about that, you know, my respect for him like dropped to zero. Mm. So yeah. Yeah. I I have some thoughts on the whole longevity thing i mean there's a lot of people in this space now where they're trying to figure out the best way to make humans live a long time and in my opinion to suggest that the remedy to longevity is a lifestyle that doesn't parallel the one that we've evolved under is a pretty radical thought like for example think about think about what what a person would say if you said if you said the best way for a lion to live an extra 10 years would be for it to eat something other than the diet that it's evolved under and to, for it to live in like something, a place other than the wild, or maybe um, you give it a bed and then it'll live longer. Like some, like as if deviating from that is going to make you live longer. 
it's it's a really radical idea in my opinion i mean i think it's so strange and it's been become so normalized this idea of biohacking like you can you can as if we're smarter than our own physiology is it, it's it's really weird yeah so I had, vegan, I had a vegan tell me once well we evolved on fruit and we were our ancestors were very small like let's say two and a half feet tall and they would climb up on trees and reach for fruit and eat the fruit and um yeah, no, I don't buy into that. Now there's the, um, what's the term I'm looking for? The study of, of uh, eth ethnic tribes and what they eat um, around the tropical um, areas of the, of the world, even though there's fruit available 24 hours a day, every day of the year, the basis of their diet was still meat. So they're eating monkeys or whatever's running around on the ground. And then fruit was something supplemental to that, but the basis was still meat for, for uh, native tribes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the idea that we that we evolved on fruit is kind of it's kind of pretty preposterous. Uh, like the, the, it's just it, it wouldn't have been, really been possible. And some people like I've heard the vegan argument where um, Milton Mills talks about it a lot. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's just this. Yeah, he 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 says that humans are naturally herbivores, which is just like, how could this be the case? I mean, have you ever been in a forest? Have you ever been into anything, a savanna or something? Like, what are you going to eat? Like, try. It's, it's there's a lot of reasons why um that's wrong. The uh M Mikey Bendor he did the the Tel Aviv hyper carnivore study, and that just completely went through everything. I mean, he talked about how just all the bioavailable nutrients are in meat and how we can't digest fiber and how our brains got smaller post agricultural revolution. I mean, there's a whole host of, of data as to why that, yeah. um, that like vegan, that we evolved as vegans ideas just makes no sense. Yeah. So Weston price, when he traveled the world in the 1930s, he looked at 134 indigenous tribes and, um, Nobody had cancer. And he went to one island. This is around the New Zealand area, I believe. And uh, there was a medical doctor there. And the doctor had been there for like 20, 30 years. And the guy said, I have not seen any cancer in any native population. But the white settlers who come here, they get cancer. Well, obviously, it's the food. That's the whole point of that, of uh, Weston Price's journey. And he said, he talked about foods of modern commerce. So obviously like white sugar, white grain products, they're going to destroy the body. But um, the, it's the, um, you know, when you're eating non-meat foods, that's part of the problem is that you're not eating meat. It's the same kind of, it's a new way of looking at it. Like if you're drinking pop, you're not drinking water. You know, mm. so not only is it detrimental, or possibly detrimental, but you're also creating a, your own nutritional deficiencies. So right. having, yeah, so I'm setting that I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because I'm setting up a scenario here. So in January, I got a new patient and she's 80 years old and she had stage four pancreatic cancer with metastasis to the liver. So she had five tumors in her liver, one in the pancreas, and then her cancer marker on the blood test, uh, CA19-9, I think it was, was um, 10,400, and we want that to be zero. Now, her A1C, which is a long-term measurement of blood glucose, was 5.7, and mm. I like to see it below 5.4. And I just told her, you're diabetic. And she goes, nobody said that to me before. I said, yeah, I know, but I'm telling you, you're diabetic. And she goes, but I've been like this for 30 years, 5.7. And I said, well, that's why you have cancer. So just, and it took me a few weeks to get her to do this. I slowly like got her to understand. Basically, I had her eating liver and red meat, and that was it. And she's Jewish, and she was very proud of her chopped liver. So she's eating chopped liver and red meat. Three months later, her cancer marker goes down to 195 from wow. 10,400. All the tumors were smaller. One was completely gone and she was, you know, getting better. And she's, she's like amazed. Like she goes, you come in this room. Every time I see you, you come in the room, you have full confidence that this is going to go away. 
you know, you, you've never faltered. And she's like, why is that? And I was like, look, I just know how the body operates. And when you don't have, you know, the, the proper food, like liver and red meat, then your body gets ill. And she had been eating like Ezekiel bread, which is like supposedly the healthiest bread. Well, the mm -hmm. problem is still bread, it's still carbs. And so, you know, that, that's a really good success story. Mm -hmm. And it's because she's, you know, it's because of eating liver and red meat. And then she got the, the poison needle into her arm and she died three months later. So don't wow. get that. <laughs> it's yeah. horrible. That poison needle. I'm not saying the word because this will get this will get censored. Yeah, that's been my experience with that. And she was man that like that was going to be a gr a great success story. And if and she hid that from me, you know, her cancer marker went from 195 and then 2,000 and 4,000. I'm like, what's going on? Like I'm pulling my hair out. Like, what did what did you change? What did you do? And she never told me. And then after her funeral, her daughter told me that she got wow. so that is yeah. I wish we could talk about it, but they would, they would, uh, they'll, they'll take, they, they won't even just take down our videos. They might even take down channels. So they're, they're just really cracking down. Um, it sucks. No, no, but, but some of the, some of the stories I've heard as well are just, just mind blowing. I mean, yesterday I talked to this guy who had triglycerides at 3000 oh. and with, within six weeks of carnivore, it was down to a hundred, like the most unbelievable things. Uh, he had an A1C of 13 13 a1c it's now it's in the sixes after um um i think three months and it's just continually getting better he was yeah. about to have his foot amputated he was a diabetic uh and now it's his foot is getting better too it's like th this th th the things that are supposed to be permanent like yeah. his his foot still should have still gone theoretically it was completely destroyed they sent me pictures and yeah. it's actually improving i mean it's it's just so amazing how resilient uh, the, uh, the the human body is and i think you're right like what you touched on in the and earlier uh, when you started what you were saying about how when you're having the soda well not only are you having something toxic but you're having it as a replacement for something that's actually nutrient dense and it's this idea that malnutrition is it's not just deficiencies it's not and it's not just toxicities it's deficiencies combined with toxicities um which is just you know it's it's uh it's creating all, all these problems. Yeah, um, I, sh I actually have a question for or you, you. You can give your thoughts on that, but I have a, I have a question for you yeah. after after. Okay. Um, so, did you see the video where I talked about my office manager and her husband, and their? No, I okay. didn't. No. So they've been with me for ten years, and um, they've been they've been uh, ke uh, keto and fasting, and of course low carb the whole time, <clears throat> no seed oils, no vegetable oils. And he's a hunter, so they have venison, salmon, they have cow in their freezer in the garage. And um, his blood pressure the whole time, 170 over 120. So they took a, a carnivore class from Maria Emmerich. And in that class, they learned to stop the olive oil, coconut oil, and um, avocado oil. No fruit, no vegetables, no plants, period. Tallow, beef, water, salt. Four weeks later, his blood pressure is 120 over 90, not medicated. So he got up his medications. And again, like he's been my patient, you know, and I'm telling him all the things that I know, all the supplements that I know, all the different ways to diet and fast and keto and intermittent fasting and all that stuff. And it's just, so when my office, she got a lot better too. And um, I asked her, what were the foods that were preventing you from having these great results. And she said, cucumbers, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, like though they're very, you know, very poisonous for some people. Mm. Go, go ahead with your question. Oh, yeah. Well, I was gonna say, I mean, right now you're doing this, you're, you're recommending carnivore for for people, and they're seeing amazing results. But were you just a regular doctor? Like at one point, were you just doing the medication and all that stuff? No, so you, I'm or, a, yeah, I'm a chiropractor. Okay. Right. So I took an oath, like I, I chose never to do drugs and uh, surgery. Awesome. So I've been, Good. I've been holistic since day one. And cool. um, so I've always been, been navigating this whole dietary thing. And yeah. Do, it makes a difference. Do, do you ever get in trouble for pushing it a little bit? I mean, have you gotten any backlash from your co colleagues or from any 
associations or like anything like that or are, are, are you are you fine i'm fine being a chiropractor is the greatest license to practice good health care because in that license you can practice with nutrition and then they incorporate electricity if you have like a tent unit or like light if you have a laser so it's the the tools that we have are so broad Whereas, whereas medical doctors, they don't have many tools. They have a few drugs mm -hmm. for surgery. You know, there's some doctors that work with, you know, like three drugs, like heartburn drugs or, you know, two pain pills. I've heard these crazy stories about, you know, there's a pain clinic that has five doctors and they work with two pain drugs. And that's it. Like a fifth grader can do that, you know? Mm. Yeah. No, yeah. That's, that's really cool. So you you basically found this little um you know profession or like the, this niche part of uh healthcare where you can actually do a lot more than you otherwise could and not really oh, yeah. face the backlash that's all awesome yeah so i attended a, a conference in the spring of this year and it's the international college of integrative medicine and their focus was on cancer for the weekend it was fantastic but their very first speaker was the lawyer for the um college and uh, he said the first thing he said he got up on stage he goes they're out to get you they hate you they want to shut you down and he spent 30 minutes talking about how to avoid that you know what to say what to not say that kind of stuff so they're but they're, that group is medical doctors and they're there it's it's uh you know tyranny over their license mm. yeah you you want to talk a little bit about the um like the evolution, uh, you, you mentioned it earlier, the, the evolution of basically diet, like how it's changed so much. I mean, I, I've been, I've been um, just talking to people who have lived through the different um, health focuses. Like at one point it was eat a, um, drink a coffee and eat a donut for breakfast. That's what you should do and put, put sugar on stuff because sugar is your energy. And then, uh, you know, a little bit later on, it's all about fiber and um, caloric restriction, uh, which is still kind of, ubiquitous today but it's it was really common in i think like 80s maybe how like i'm sure you researched this how has how has the the guidelines changed how oh how have the health trends changed are they like the consensus if you will yeah yeah consensus yeah. is good um <clears throat> well you know and I, i've read books and studied all the way you know back into the 1800s and um there wasn't like a, a push to create a healthy nation or, you know, like a group of people that are healthy until, I mean, and there, there was, there was the first book on low carb diet was like 1880 or something. And um, it was by a, a mortician and the name of the book is a little pamphlet and it was called a letter on uh, an open letter on P corpulence. And so at the time, you know, just look at what the food supply consisted of. So people would hunt and they would fish and they raised animals and they had a garden, but yet there was sugar coming into the, into the food supply. And it was in that era of like the 1880s, that's when the industrial revolution took off. And the same thing with the revolution, the industrial industrialization of food. So mm. processed food, Tootsie Rolls, Dr. Pepper, Coca-Cola, adding sugar. And then white bread and white bread was really bad in the early 1900s, 1910, 1920. And then people were dying because of white bread. 1934 was the first time they put a vitamin in white bread. They put in vitamin B1 and it saved lives. I mean, people stopped dying of heart attacks, even 10 year old. Why? Well, white bread in 1930 was just a sugar. It was just carbohydrate with nothing else. Whereas the whole wheat bread had a shelf life of three days. It had all the vitamin E and, you know, all the other minerals and stuff in it, the oils, essential oils, or not essential oils, but um, um, essential fatty acids and stuff like that. So the the condition that white bread brought was uh, very, very. So vitamin B1 is a solution for that. So yeah, 10-year-old boys were actually having heart attacks because of the white bread. And that was the Great Depression too. So nobody had any money. And um, so white bread was given out for free because it was so cheap to make. Mm. And so, um, but it was, that era was also tainted by 
the Seventh Day Adventists and their vegan push, and they had a prophet that said, you know, if you are, um, if you want to stop people from fighting and masturbating, then they got to stop eating meat, and that was part of the religion. And so that was Dr. Kellogg, you know, Kellogg cereal, right. that kind of stuff. So throughout, you know, those, you know, from 1850 to 1950, there's just like these insults on our natural diet. But then it became more a modernization or industrialization after Ansel Keys in the 1950s, right? And after World War II, corporations got really big, the, especially the pharmaceutical companies. And, um, and in the 60s, that's when um, Harvard was bribed to promote sugar. Right, right. Okay, yeah. yeah, so the 70s, we, we just we just all need to forget about the 70s. <laughs> Except for the music was good, but... Um, and then, so, but we're recovering, you know, as a, as a society. And the internet has a lot to do with it. Thank God for the internet. And the censorship, though, is really bad. You know, we got to stop this, this censorship. Mm -hmm. you know when you when you squash the truth like you like people are then what you're left with is lies you know mm -hmm. right no i i think the internet is is really interesting um in that sure there's a lot of lies but if you have a there's a lot of truth too so it's better to have the whole scope of of everything right you have the lies mixed with the truth than just be given one idea, which might be a lie, it might be a truth, you don't really know. I mean, I just think about just the, how, um, how research has changed. Like my grandfather, just, you know, I, I talked to him a decent amount, and he tells me about just how, how they learned back then. And they learned by uh, listening to someone and what they heard was what they internalized, essentially. And today, there's just so much out there and there's so much to sort of to just decipher between. But I, th I think it's, it's more beneficial than it is harmful. Uh, absolutely. Just because, you know, you, you can find the truth. It's, it's there. You just, you need to search. Yeah. So with all the attention on diet, um, it, you know, the diet, it, it deserves a lot of attention, but um, I'm also trying to expose you know, this term unlucky exposures. So I had the black mold from my old office and it basically almost, it almost killed me in 2016. And then uh, I've been working with a supplement company called Cellcore Biosciences and they have fantastic products to get parasites out of people. You know, so when you can change your diet from vegan to keto carnivore and still have mold in your body and still have parasites and still have chemicals and all that stuff. So I think when people are scrambling to change their diet in order to help their own body heal and it doesn't work, then you're, you got to find the, the ex unlucky exposures that you've had. Yeah. Now, yeah. So let's talk about Paul Saladino. I love him. He's awesome. He wrote a book on carnivore diet, but after a year and a half of being carnivore, he, his psoriasis came back and he couldn't sleep very well. And his testosterone went down. I think he's got parasites, you know? And so there's a, Ooh. yeah, the psoriasis, psoriasis is parasites. Like I've seen that so many times in my career. And there was a guy um, yesterday found on TikTok and he's talking about, I forgot his health condition. Oh, um, celiac disease. So his doctor, and you know, this is a really good doctor to diagnose celiac disease. He stops eating wheat and then all his symptoms go away. Okay, that's great. You're, he's got parasites. Food allergies are commonly parasites, especially dairy allergies. You know, and then there's it's really rare, but some people are bit by a tick. They get infected with a certain um, organism, and that they become allergic to meat. You know, right. have you heard about the guy who's trying to engineer people to be allergic to meat? I saw that. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. World Economic Forum, right? Probably no. No, that's really interesting. Um, I mean, I've always like, after going carnivore, I started learning more about the environmental triggers that are also worth noting besides the diet. Um, things like just just other toxins we put in our bodies, like shampoo, conditioner, deodorant, toothpaste, like all this stuff is pretty bad has some pretty bad chemicals in there. 
um, that we shouldn't be consuming. But the mold and the parasites, I mean, that's something that that's relatively new to me. How are those? How what in our environment today? Like what? How have we deviated um, from natural living in in such a way that these manifest more often? The mold is uh, manifest more often because we have water damaged buildings. Okay. Whether the roof is leaky or there's pipes inside that are uh, leaking or uh, have water condensation and then it settles on something that's organic like wood or drywall and then the mold starts to grow leaky windows uh, flooding on the floor and 70 percent of the buildings in the united states and in the uk have enough mold to negatively a- a- affect the inhabitants mm. so there's that and regarding parasites um if there's more parasites now than let's say 200 years ago or a thousand years ago, it might be because we have pets, cats and dogs in the house. Hmm. Yeah. Otherwise we're pretty much more protected because we wear shoes. We don't walk so much on soil and sand barefoot. We wash our hands more. That's good. Um, but yeah, I mean, parasites are just a part of life. You know, I think, I think everybody's got parasites. It's just the question is how much does it negatively affect your life? Yeah, it's probably true. A thousand years ago, probably everybody had parasites. I mean, you're born with parasites, so yeah, yeah. So it's just that. Hmm. So were the parasites just as detrimental? I mean, a thousand years ago. Uh, that yeah. Wrote... yeah. But the other thing is, here's a better answer to your question: When you're eating a lot of sugar and grains, you're increasing the the sugar in your blood right? The A1C goes to 5.7, 6.0, whatever. And then the organisms in your body eat the sugar. So now you have a greater amount of what I call bio burden, just organisms in your body. And so the sugar destroys your tissue and then excess insulin destroys your tissue. And then the organisms that eat the sugar destroy your tissue. So it's just, it's just a big soup of destruction to your tissue. So that's why eating low carb is so so important even if people don't get into ketosis or they're not interested in carnivore you still got to eat low carb to keep the sugar in your blood down so you're not feeding candida parasites bacteria that kind of stuff Mm. no yeah it it makes so much sense and it, it also just makes sense that we're more um our bodies are more resilient to all these different things while in a low carb state like even things that aren't directly like you wouldn't directly associate with diet um it just makes sense that we function better in in a state where we're not spiking blood sugar that often right yeah i have a book um it's at home and it was written in 600 a.d really i can't remember the guy's name he was he was a persian and um the name of the book was um on it was like on lentils and um pulses that's the name of the book or that at least the chapter on lentils and pulses and he described how when people eat more of those grains and beans it weakens it softens their tissues makes them weaker and leaves their body with acid and then it creates a scenario where they get um more typhus or some i forgot some infectious you know contagious disease so he's blaming uh, like a pandemic on, on legumes and pulses. So that was, you know, that's really, back home, yeah, back in 600. It's really interesting. Just the, the, the more ancient wisdom that we had where um, it, cause it was all founded on intuition rather than just bad science and money motivated interest and stuff like that. Yeah. It was just observation. Yeah. Yeah. Observation. Yeah, exactly. And um, you know, I just like my, my grandparents, um, have even always known like my my grandma used to love calf brain and love eating all the organs and the um sweetbreads and stuff like that and they always just seem to know what's right like they always seem to know what you shouldn't do and if you're sick you shouldn't eat sugar and you should get sun and it's just it's it seems like we've just strayed away from very very basic intuition and logic and one thing that i've tried to just implement on this whole journey where i'm trying to learn is making sure it's all logical um, and, and founded in at least to a degree, at least in 
and intuition because i think that's one of the most powerful just yeah. just sensory like factors that we can consider yeah <clears throat> when i have a patient that's really sick with mold i'll tell them you have to look at the food that's available let's say you go to a healthy grocery store you go to the deli and you look at the different cuts of meat and uh, what's what's available and you have to like really look at it right and use some some feelings here about does that look appetizing to me or not you know because sometimes mm -hmm. you can get like um random unpredictable food allergies when you have mold and i call that diet the eat to live diet every day you have to figure out exactly what you need to eat to live that day while you're detoxing mold out of your body mm -hmm. yeah yeah, no, so 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 it's like they have mold, and if they they're looking at a food and it seems like it's bad to them, then you say avoid that. Is is, is that is that the right message? Yeah, exactly. It's Got anyway. it. Yeah, yesterday I gave a lecture, and in preparation for that, um, I was on a Wikipedia page, and Wikipedia is a total disaster. But for the sake of this lecture, I was I was using it, and in this one page, it said. You know, it was uh, bashing something in the alternative healthcare uh, field. And it said that this subject is based on anecdotal evidence, not empirical evidence. Okay. And they were both highlighted. So I clicked on anecdotal e evidence and it said that, you know, this evidence, you know, is not scientifically observable or something like that. And then I clicked on empirical evidence and it said that empirical evidence is something that you can observe. And the subject, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's right there on Wikipedia. Like, if you can observe it, that's empirical evidence. Now, the subject was on mucoid plaque. So I put people on these supplements to clean their intestines out. They get four-foot rope worms out of their butt, you know, and it smells like dead fish, and it's absolutely horrible. And then they get better, right, over time. And, like, that's empirical evidence. Like, that's the basis of all science is that you – you saw it in the toilet and it smelled horrible and you feel better. But here, you know, Wikipedia was trying to bash <laughs> mucoid plaque when, you know, in another page they're saying, yeah, this is actually empirical evidence. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it the, devaluing empiricism is, uh, it's just, you know, it, it, it it's just illogical when it's what, it's what logic is founded on so yeah. it, it, you can't you can't really um not give credence to it yeah what are you studying in school um i am so oh i, I we can actually talk about this for for a sec um i i don't know if i'm gonna finish i don't i'm not a huge fan of what i'm learning I'm, i don't like the environment here everyone is of a certain belief with regards to like the recent sickness with gender and it's just a it's just an idea a group of people with ideas that i don't resonate with it's a group of people who i don't particularly like or find similarities with and and the, and the actual education itself is, is terrible like it's it's really really bad in in my cell molecular biology class the one class that i figured would have interesting stuff they're basically looking at science from a social lens so they don't they don't want to actually discuss science. We spent a fair amount of time talking about social aspects of science and how your identity is going to affect the way you look at science. And it's just a lot of sort of irrelevant, redundant ideas that I that I, I'd so much rather replace with just learning online from people that I respect, watching podcasts with brilliant people. It's like, um, yeah. Uh, so. Sorry, I, I I booked this room until twelve, and it's it's done now. So uh, if you want to give me like your thoughts really quick, then but we're gonna have to end it pretty much now. I'm sorry about that. Okay, no, that's cool. We've been at this for an hour, but um, yeah, like um, when I look at um how schools are performing, they're very dismal, and YouTube is pretty fantastic. And if you want to learn basic science, there's Kajabi and there's other um you know, free online courses and stuff, you get the very fundamentals of, you know, cellular physiology and mitochondrial function and nutrition and all that kind of stuff, you know. So, uh, yeah. And then, and then business. So I'm a business owner and uh, marketing and all this stuff. I, I go to YouTube a lot. I, I learn a lot on social media.
Cool. Yeah, I got my other resources too. I got consultants too, but yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I'm, I'm sure we have to end this. Um, uh, we could keep going for a long time, but I'd love to do it again. Love to do it again at some point. Um, okay. It's been great talking to you. And um, yeah, I think, I think uh, I, I really look up to you. I really respect what you're doing and um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, good job with your channel and um, you're um, an eloquent speaker. That's, that's, thank my, you. <laughs> when I first heard you speak, I was like, Oh, this guy's awesome. That's why I sent you an email like right away. I've never done that before. You know, so good job. I appreciate good it. Work. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, take care. Great.